Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, we're so thankful to be in your house today. Thank you for your kindness to us and your uh, mercy upon us, Lord, and letting us live another week. And Lord, I thank you for the health that you give and the strength that you give. Um, Lord, I pray that uh, today as we open your word together, Lord, that your truth would be exalted, that your son would be exalted, and Lord, that our lives would be changed as a result uh, of our exposure to your word. Uh, Lord, we thank you for just this privilege, and I pray for these, uh, all, all of us uh, this morning, Lord, that we would be impacted uh, by uh, your word. Lord, we are aware of many needs um, in our church family. I pray that you would uh, be especially with Jenny Supel as uh, she continues her uh, journey to Papua New Guinea. Uh, we pray for safety for her, and Lord, we pray that uh, that she would just bring glory to you through her ministry uh, to the Owens uh, and with the Owens over there. Um, Lord, we pray that um, you would be with those who are not able to be with us today for health reasons or uh, those who are aware of of needs, Lord, in their families or friends, Lord, who are who are not feeling well and um, who need your your healing touch, need your grace in their lives, Lord, not only to heal, but to also draw them to yourself through these trials. And Lord, we pray that you would do that as well. We pray for our nation, Lord, as we uh, prepare for another election. We pray that your perfect will would be done, Lord, that, that Christians would um, would pray and would be involved. And Lord, I pray that, that you would be glorified. Um, thank you for this morning, and we pray that you would be uh, glorified now in Jesus name. Amen. We are thankful to have uh, a ministry team from Southland Christian Camp uh, with us today and uh, Micah and Emily Herbster uh, are with us and also Michael McIntyre and then Josh Gillespie are all with us. Michael is uh, speaking to the teens downstairs and uh, they were here. Um, they got here Friday night and they ministered to our teens all day yesterday. We, we threw them into the middle of it, and uh, they ran the games. Mike, or, uh, Micah preached four times yesterday and did an excellent job, and they have really, really done a fine job in ministering to our teens, and it's been a real real blessing to get to know them a little bit. Um, we, have, we have enjoyed uh, talking with them, and, and also uh, some of us have seen them multiple times at camp, and so it's good to have them with us. They'll be uh, sharing a little about the camp tonight and uh, giving giving some more information about that, but uh, Micah is going to come and just present uh, what the Lord's laid on his heart for our Sunday school time. Micah? Well, good morning to each of you. We are delighted to be here and so thankful for the opportunity uh, that we had yesterday to be with your young people and had a really fun and full day with lots of amazing games and some delicious food. I think the highlight of the day for me was the breakfast for dinner and really enjoyed some good cinnamon rolls and some eggs, some hash browns. So we back-to-back -back meals were breakfast, which was a blessing, okay? And uh, we just feel very privileged to be with you all today. Uh, and my wife Emily is right down here on the front. My name is Micah, and our last name is Herbster. Uh, some of you may remember, if you were here in 2007, my family was here. My dad is Mike Herbster, and then my uncle Mark. They traveled in evangelism for many years. And so the last time I was here at Friendship, I was probably a little bit shorter and a lot less mature, hopefully, than I am now, okay? And, uh, and then I was here in 2021 with the praise men from Maranatha Baptist University. And so it's good to see some familiar faces and to be in a familiar church. And we're so thankful for the partnership that our ministry down in Louisiana can have uh, with your church here in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and bringing your teenagers down to uh, summer camp that we have down in Louisiana. How many of you have been to Louisiana before, all right? Okay, good. Many of you. I, I always tell people it's not one of those states that you just happen to swing through. You got to really go there on purpose and be very intentional in getting down to the southern part of the United States. Uh, but the Lord has allowed my wife and I to be there at the camp for two years now. Been married for two years and we travel full time uh, for the camp and promote the camp and do revival meetings and things like what we're doing here at your church this weekend. And we're just so thankful for all of the opportunities that the Lord has given to us and excited to look into God's word together this morning. Let's take our Bibles, please, and turn to the 145th Psalm together. Psalm 145 is where we'll spend our time in our Sunday school hour. I often have the opportunity to preach to teenagers 
And uh, so I feel like it's a little bit more rare to do a Sunday school class to the adults. So I really count it a privilege and uh, to speak to you this morning, really pray that it'll be an encouragement to all of our hearts. And I'm always reminded in moments like this that it is the Word of God that we need. And uh, I'm not here to give you any new information from a young 24-year-old kid, right? I'm here to just declare, thus saith the Lord. And by the grace of God, I hope that our hearts will be stirred this morning in our affections for the Lord as we prepare our hearts for the worship time and our morning service. And as we dedicate this day to the Lord, to set it aside to, as unique and special, that in our hearts, even as we begin this morning, we would be mindful of that, that we are not just going through religious routine, but we are here to worship and praise the living Lord. And so I hope that we'll come to this text even in Psalm 145 uh, this morning with that in mind. Psalm 145 obviously comes toward the end of the psalm book, and it is actually David's final psalm that is given in the 150 psalms of the Hebrew psalm book. And Spurgeon called this psalm David's crown jewel of praise. It is God-focused. It is God-honoring, God-exalting. It is a psalm of worship, a psalm of exaltation for who God is and for what God has done, not only in the life of David personally, but in the ministry and the really the kingdom work that David had in the literal kingdom of Israel and praising the Lord for all that he had done for God's people, for God's nation of Israel. What I'd like to do this morning is just begin by reading through the entire psalm and then directing our attention to primarily the first portion of, of, the, of this 145th Psalm, but notice as we read these words together, the emphasis and the emphatic nature of praise through this Psalm. We'll begin reading in verse 1 of Psalm 145. The psalmist says there, I will extol thee, my God, O King, and I will bless thy name forever and ever. Every day will I bless thee, and I will praise thy name forever and ever. Great is the Lord greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise thy works to another and shall declare thy mighty acts. I will speak of the glorious honor of thy majesty and of thy wondrous works, and men shall speak of the might of thy terrible acts, and I will declare thy greatness. They shall abundantly utter the memory of thy great goodness and shall sing of thy righteousness." The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. All thy works shall praise thee, O Lord, and thy saints shall bless thee. They shall speak of the glory of thy kingdom and talk of thy power to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. Thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and thy dominion endureth throughout all generations. The Lord upholdeth all that fall, and raiseth up all those that be bowed down. The eyes of all wait upon thee, and thou givest them their meat in due season. Thou openest thine hand, and satisfiest the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways, and holy in all his works. The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of them that fear him. He also will hear their cry and will save them. The Lord preserveth all them that love him, but all the wicked will he destroy. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord, and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. What a magnificent psalm, which is really bookend, uh, on the bookends of this, this praise, the spirit of exaltation and spirit of praise. In the first place, in verse 1, he wants to extol the Lord, to lift up the Lord. And in the very last verse that we just read, he says, My mouth shall speak of the praise of the Lord. I want you to notice, just by way of introduction in this psalm, the multifaceted, multi-direction that this praise is being offered to the Lord. If you notice this in verse 2, it says here, Every day will I bless thee, and I will praise thy name forever and ever. So here is the psalmist himself praising the Lord for his excellencies, praising the Lord for his mighty acts. 
It is from David to the Lord. And don't you know that in our lives, personally, there ought to be a praise and an adoration, yes, in corporate worship in this church, but also on a day-to-day basis, a personal praise for all that God has done for us. So there's that direction of from man to God. But then notice in verse 10, where the psalmist says that thy works shall praise thee. So not only ought we to praise the Lord, but even the mighty works, the mighty acts of God reflect praise and glory and adoration back to the Lord. Think of things like creation. The heavens declare what? The glory of God. Even creation itself points praise and adoration back to the creator God. And specifically in Psalm 145, all of the mighty acts that God had done on behalf of his people. You think of what the Israelites experienced in being delivered out of Egypt and crossing the Red Sea and coming into the promised land eventually. Being established there in that new kingdom, in that new nation, God's people. And how all of those works, they would for generations to come look back on those works that God had performed and said, Those works praise the Lord. They reflect glory and honor, not to any one leader like Moses or Abraham or David, but back to the Lord. And then finally, in verse 4, I want you to notice the multi-generation aspect of this praise. One generation, he says in verse 4 of Psalm 145, one generation shall praise thy works to another. So our praise in Psalm 145 is directed to the Lord, Creation, God's works, reflects praise back to the Lord. And then, according to verse 4, generation to generation, praise the Lord in between so that the mighty acts, the mighty works, the greatness of God would be passed on from generation to generation. And this is really what I want to spend our time considering in this Sunday school hour this morning, this multi-generation, generational passing on of the praise of the excellency and the magnificence and the splendor and the wonder of God's mighty acts. I don't know if you've seen these advertisements on the road or on billboards or in airports perhaps, but they're signs that are inspirational in nature. Uh, Some of them would have pictures of George Washington or the Wright brothers and some pithy statement next to it about those individuals. And then it states one in one word what they exemplify. Maybe George Washington, courageous. And then in that little box in the corner, it's, it's pass it on. Have any of you ever seen those the pass it on ads before? Um, I asked my wife when I first started talking about these ads, have you ever seen these ads? She said, I've never seen them. And then I mentioned this to her and she said, now I can't help but see them. They're everywhere, you know. And so maybe keep an eye out for them. They're very inspirational. But what is the point of those advertisements? It is to inspire and influence somebody else to have courage like George Washington had, have innovation like the Wright brothers had, and then in having that, then to pass it on to somebody else. And that really is the call to us in Psalm 145 as believers to not just be satisfied with personal praise, although, as we'll see in just a moment, is vitally important to the passing on of praise, but to then take the praise and the wonder and the relationship with God that we have and pass it on to another generation. What an opportunity that is as believers that God has given us to not only praise and worship the Lord individually, but then to raise up and rear up another generation that would know the Lord, that would praise him for his mighty acts. I want to draw your attention in these first few verses to the communication of our praise. Because like I said before, Before we ever look to another generation, another individual, and encourage them in what we might call discipleship or praising the Lord, it's very important that we understand how this applies to our life individually. What are we passing on? And this communication of praise helps us to understand that. He uses this word in the very first phrase of the psalm, I will extol thee. Probably not a word that you use typically, that word extol. But this word is used 190 times in our Old Testament, and it literally means to raise up, to lift up, to elevate something. And the psalmist was saying in verse 1 of Psalm 145, I will lift up the Lord. I will raise him up. He is high and he is lifted up, and I will recognize him as that. It is to elevate. It's used to describe in the Old Testament the ark 
of the Noah built, literally being raised up above the earth. Literal elevation. It's used in the book of Psalms to describe how God lifts up the fallen, lifts up the needy. In Psalm 3 and verse 3, Thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory. And God is literally the lifter up, literally the same word that we're reading in verse 1 of Psalm 145, the lifter up of my head. And in many ways, in Psalms, it is used to describe how we as God's creation ought to view God. Listen to what the Bible says in Psalm 30 and verse 1. I will, same phrase, extol thee, O Lord, for thou hast lifted me up. In Psalm 118 and verse 28, thou art my God and I will praise thee. Thou art my God, my God, I will, and here's the word, I will exalt thee. We communicate our praise to the Lord, not by bringing God down to our level, but by raising God up to his rightful place. And isn't this a tendency in broad evangelicalism today, right? In Christianity in America, where everybody just wants the hip Jesus, the cool God. They want to bring God down to, to man's level. But no, praise in the right sense is to lift him up, to communicate our high and lofty view of God. And so he uses that word extol, and then he uses in verse 1, the word bless, literally to ascribe blessing to the Lord. I will bless particularly his name, Yahweh, the great I am, the self-existent one. This is the communication of our praise. And what an opportunity we have this morning, folks, to do just this in our worship time together, to take our minds off of the temporal things, Take our minds off of the struggles and the hurts and the anxieties to, of today and fix our hope in God to exalt the Lord, to lift him up and to bless and to bless his name. I love what one writer said about this verse. He said, this is the expression of the greatest possible admiration. It is letting others know our high opinion of a person and endeavoring to win them over by it. That is that if somebody were to look at your life and your praise, your exaltation of the Lord, would they get the right opinion of God by the way that you praise, by the way that you extol the Lord? This is the communication of praise. I want you to notice not only this communication of praise, but the characteristics of praise. Before we pass this on, it's very, very important that we continually remember and recommit to this type of praise, this type of adoration of the Lord in our own life. Notice, first of all, in these verses that this praise is profoundly personal. David, the psalmist, says, I will extol thee, I will bless thee, I will bless thee, again in verse 2, I will praise thy name forever and ever. Do you know that before you ever pass on the praise and the exaltation of the Lord to another generation, this is something that you have to experience personally. I emphasized this to the teenagers yesterday as we looked at Philippians 3 and verse 10 where the Apostle Paul there had a, a personal pursuit of the Lord. And I, and I said to them, you can't ride on the coattails of somebody else in knowing the Lord. And it's the very same in our praise to the Lord. You can't just hope that, well, because I'm in a good church and because uh, I have a good pastor, I must be praising the Lord like I should. No, this is profoundly personal. And it's not just something that takes place on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, but it is a lifestyle, a life pattern of praising the Lord. Not only is it personal, but it is repetitive. Notice in these verses the usage of this phrase forever and ever, both in verse 1 and in verse 2. It's not perfection, okay? Nobody's perfect, right? But it is the pattern, the habitual pattern of this exaltation, this blessing of the Lord. It happens over and over. And then this praise is really aimed, directed towards our king. You notice this in these verses. He is my God and my king, David says in verse 1. And then this praise is promoted in verse 4, which is really what I would like to emphasize to all of us this morning, that praise, personal praise, will make a difference in the lives of those that we touch. In other words, as we praise the Lord individually, that will radiate from our lives. It will be that as we think about it and as we habitually and in a disciplined, patterned way praise and extol and bless the Lord, the people that we have the opportunity to influence, they will be recipients of that view of God in some way, shape, or form. 
Think of this in, a, in the home, right? How a parent's praise exemplifies to their children both what they think of God and how they believe they ought to praise and worship the Lord. It's almost like the children can't help but be influenced by their parents' view of God, for better or for worse. But the call to us is to really be very disciplined in this and to know the praise, the way in which we ought to praise and extol the Lord so that those that we influence, as verse 4 says, would know the mighty acts of God. This is a major theme all throughout the psalm book, this generational cycle of praise. In, in this verse, of course, one generation shall praise thy works to another. But listen to what the Bible says in Psalm 71 and verse 18. The psalmist there says, Now also when I am old and gray-headed, O God, forsake me not, until I have showed thy strength unto this generation, and thy power to everyone that is come. And then again in Psalm 78 and verse 4, We will not hide them from their children, talking about God's work, God's acts, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done. And then again in Psalm 100 and verse 5, the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to how many generations? All generations. And again in the 102nd Psalm in verse 18, this shall be written for the generation to come. There's something in the psalm book that the psalmist had this This generational, multi-generation perspective of, listen, it's not just about me getting all of this right now, but actually then being able to pass it on to another generation. To be able to look at the children of an up-and-coming generation and teach them the ways of the Lord and the works and the acts of God. I think about this often in the ministry that the Lord has given us down at Southland Christian Ministries. We are primarily a youth camp ministry. And we run 10 weeks of summer camp through the summer, have about uh, 2,500 young people, teenagers, come through the camp facility. And I think of verses like this often. This is really what's at the heart of a Christian youth camp ministry. The passing on of the greatness and the majesty of the Lord. Yes, we want them to have a good time, and we hope that they do. But at the end of the day, we, we want them to know the Lord personally. We want them to know his greatness. We want them to know his his power and his ability and what he's done in the past and what we're praying for him to do in the future as well. This is what we ought to pass on, this praise, this exaltation, this blessing of the Lord. And I often challenge teenagers to be recipients of that. That is, that they would not reject the instruction of older, wiser, more mature believers, that they would be receptive and humble enough to say, I don't have all the answers. I don't know everything about the word of God, and I encourage them in that way, but may I just encourage you, as not a younger generation, okay, to be the type of individuals that would pass on, that would really prioritize the passing on of Christian doctrine, Christian truth to another generation. In our travels, it always amazes me to hear what older generations prioritize in passing on to younger generations. There are so many things that an older generation may want a younger generation to know. You better be a fan of the Kansas City Chiefs, let me tell you. You better, you better grow up and be the farmer that I need you to be on this farm, and they'll be very passionate about the next generation taking on something. You better, you better make lots of money, and I hear parents and grandparents so con- hyper-concerned about their young people making all sorts of money being popular, being influential, climbing the corporate ladder. And I just want to encourage you older generations that are beyond my generation and beyond the teenager's generation to prioritize the passing on of the Christian faith, the passing on of Christian praise. Don't give in to the lie of the devil that you don't have influence. I hear older people often say, well, the younger generations, they just don't listen. (laughs) And that is true, isn't it? Believe me, we work with 2,500 teenagers every single summer, and we're traveling all the time seeing younger generations who stiff arm the teaching of older people. And it saddens my heart. It really does. I believe God, God is working in many teenagers' hearts to bring them to a place where they are receptive. But that doesn't give older generations any excuse to stop teaching. 
to stop passing on the praise and the exaltation and the glory and the mighty works of God. No, just because they're not listening doesn't mean you stop instructing, stop teaching, stop passing on this praise, but continue in that till the day you die. I believe that was David's heart in his life. That as he went into his older years, he was continually pouring out his praise to the Lord and in doing so, passing it on to another generation. Think, think folks, to the Old Testament, to situations like that monument that was erected on the other side of the Jordan by the 12 tribes. And think of the, the broader perspective that they had in erecting that monument to the Lord. Was it just for that generation to go back and, ex- and think about what they had experienced? Not just for them. No, there was a multi-generational perspective that they had that, hey, in five generations, I want my great, 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 great grandkids to be able to come back to this monument and say, wow, our God is good. Our God is gracious. Our God is powerful. And I believe that is the, the mindset, the perspective that we ought to have in our generational passing on of the praise. Now, the question then is, what is the content of this praise? What is it that we ought to pass on to another generation of the things of, the, of, of God? And I believe, really, you could say the whole teaching of Scripture, of course. But the psalmist in Psalm 145 really pairs this down for us. And I just want to emphasize these four characteristics of our God to you this morning that we would personally think deeply about these aspects, these characteristics of God, and then in our teaching of another generation and a passing on of praise to another generation, really think about practical ways to pass on these four qualities of God to the next generation. The first is the greatness of God. Notice what the text says in verse 3. Great is the Lord. This is who he is. This is his character. And as a result, notice that this in verse 3, he is greatly to be praised. And his greatness is unsearchable. So three times in that text, we read the word great. Great, greatly, and greatness. God is great, and he deserves great praise. Notice what it says in verse 5 as well. I will speak of the glorious honor of thy majesty and of thy wondrous works. In verse 6, men shall speak of the might of thy terrible acts, and I will declare thy greatness. David says. These words help us to realize the undescribable nature of God, that he is so great, he is so above us, he is so so much grander and larger than we are. He is great. He is not like we are. Praise the Lord for that, right? He is outside of space. He's outside of time. He is creator God. And according to Isaiah 40 and verse 28, there is no searching of his understanding. There is no way that we could begin to comprehend the magnitude and the greatness and the power and the magnitude of who God is. Doesn't that make you feel small to think of how great and large and grand and great God is? Because of that, he deserves praise that is characterized by what we read in verse 3, greatly to be praised. He deserves that great praise. I love what Spurgeon said about these verses. He said, it is the occupation of every true believer to rehearse the great doings of his great God. What has God done in your life that is great? Saving you? bringing you to a wonderful church, allowing you to have a, a good job, allowing you to have a relationship with the, with the Lord, the Word of God, and the, the faculties to memorize the Word of God, the opportunity to go before the throne of grace to praise the Lord, to request things of the Lord. He is great, and the blessings of God are innumerable, aren't they, in our life? So we ought to pra- pass on and experience this greatness of God in our life. This is the content of praise. But notice second of all in verse 7 and 9, not just the greatness of God, but the goodness of God. In verse 7 he says, these people who are declaring his greatness will abundantly utter, literally bubble over, to be exuberant, excited about the memory of thy great goodness, and shall sing of thy righteousness. And then notice in verse 8 as well, 
I'm sorry, verse 9, the Lord is good, and his tender mercies are over all his works. The goodness of God, one author said, should not be buried in the cemetery of silence or in the grave of ingratitude. That is, that as we experience God's gracious gifts to us and his goodness toward us, we should not be silent about rejoicing and praising the giver of those good gifts. And isn't it easy sometimes to become so so entitled to the things that we enjoy and we think, well, we deserve these things. Could I just remind you this morning, you don't deserve the good gifts that God has given to you. Nobody does. Every good and perfect gift, James says, comes down from the Father of lights. He is the giver of all good things. And of course, there is no greater good that the Lord has provided for us than in the grace that was shown on the cross of Calvary. And that is really the third characteristic of our God that's found in verse 8, which is sandwiched between these verses on God's goodness. Verse 8, the Lord is gracious. He is full of compassion. He is slow to anger, and he is of great mercy. Think of this, folks, this morning, of your own sin and your own soul and the your own separation from an almighty God and that relationship that was severed in the beginning of time and how we are in our fallen state enemies of God, dead in our trespasses and sins. There's nothing lovely here for God to look upon and say, that I, I need that or I want that. No. Salvation is a gift and it is a gift that we do not deserve and it is a gift that has come because our God is gracious. He is merciful. He delights, Micah says, he delights in loving kindness and mercy in Micah chapter 7. That's who our God is. Could I just encourage you this morning to pause and praise the Lord for your salvation, for the mercy that he shows, for his grace that has been extended to you in the Lord Jesus Christ. Christian, no, don't ever forget that wonderful gift. It's so easy sometimes, isn't it, to just sit back and think, well, I've been saved for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And that tends to, in some cases, diminish our praise for our salvation. But may I just encourage you that your salvation is the primary, one of the primary reasons that we ought to praise the Lord. You read throughout the psalm books and you constantly see the psalm is praising the Lord for redemption, for freedom, for salvation. The Lord is our salvation. And what a blessing to think about that even this morning. So we ought to have this praise of God's greatness, praise of God's goodness, praise for God's grace. And finally this morning, in verses 11 through 13, praise for God's glory. Notice what the Bible says in verse 11. They shall speak of the glory of thy kingdom and talk of thy power to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. Thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and thy dominion endureth throughout all generations. Notice how he's connecting God's glory to this, this kingdom kind of picture. Think of how David, of course, experienced this. The majesty and the might and the glory, the splendor, the heaviness, the weightiness of a literal kingdom as the king. And he looks to the Lord and he says, this is how I'm going to describe God's glory. He's high and he's lifted up. He is seated on his throne and his kingdom is the whole of the, in the whole universe. He is over all things. This is a glorious God. He is not small. He is mighty. He is not here. He is everywhere, and he is ruling over all things. The word glory that's used in this text is the word kavod. It's literally used to describe the, the worth or the weight or the wealth of something. And that is used to describe the Lord, and the glory is due to the Lord because he is glorious. He is worthy of our praise this morning. In verse 11, it says, they shall speak of the glory of thy kingdom and talk of thy power. I wonder this morning, when was the last time that somebody found you talking of the glory of the kingdom of God and the power that our God possesses? 
Is this something that's readily on your lips that just ooze, oozes out of you in conversation? This glory that is spoken of is something that really applies to our, our life, not just in church life as we worship the Lord this morning and we, we fellowship with one another and we sing praises to the Lord, to God be the glory, great things he has done, but in our daily living, is your life reflecting your appreciation and your acknowledgement for the glory of the Lord? Because listen, if you recognize the Lord as glorious and seated on his throne, you will recognize that he is the ultimate authority. He is ruling and he is reigning over all things, and we ought to be, as subjects to his kingdom, submitted to his will. And that is, in part, how we pass on to another generation, not just by giving lip service and teaching service, but by living what we profess with our mouths. We've lost too many young people, too many generations, to hypocrisy in the home, hypocrisy in spiritual leaders, quote-unquote. Where a spiritual leader will get up in a pulpit or get up in a Sunday school classroom and preach all the right things, but the, the rest of the week they won't live the right way. They won't live what they're teaching. And God help our spiritual leaders in our churches today to be the real deal. And God help our parents who are in homes raising and rearing children to be the real deal, to practice what they're preaching to live out what they're professing and to exemplify the weightiness of the glory of God in their life. And then in verse 12, he desires to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. In verse 13, thy kingdom, this kingdom, what we're seeking to praise, what we're exalting God for is something that is, note in verse 13, everlasting. And it's enduring I love this, through all generations. What a blessing this morning to think about these wonderful characteristics of the Lord, that this is something that is going to outlive and outlast every single one of us. The question is, what will you do to pass this on? What will you do in your personal walk to praise and extol and bless, bless the Lord? I'll just testify to this passing on from generation to generation generation. I'm so thankful for the opportunity to grow up in a Christian home. And I'm realizing more and more the older I get that that is a blessing that not all of God's people have in their life. And uh, my dad was an evangelist and we traveled in evangelism for 15 years and so thankful for that opportunity. And my dad practiced, not perfectly, okay, not perfectly at all, but he practiced this type of generational perspective of, listen, my, my role in life, and specifically in Micah's life, is to pass on not just what I like, what I love, what I like to do, or some career, but the praises and the wonder and the glory and the majesty of the Lord. And of course, he was a recipient of that by the grace of God from his dad. And many of you know my grandfather. He was here just a couple weeks ago, Dr. Carl Herbster. So thankful for his influence in my life, mostly by extension of his pouring into my dad's life and then my dad pouring into my life spiritually. And even just thinking of that three generation, those three generations and how that compound effect, where here is a Carl Herbster passing it on to Mike Herbster, who then passes on to Micah Herbster, by God's grace, Lord willing, someday Micah Herbster to another generation, seeking to pass on just what David has described for us here in Psalm 145, the greatness of God, the goodness of God, his grace and his glory. And what I'm just trying to emphasize to all of us this morning is that does not happen by accident. And in some ways, I've experienced that as well, because my grandfather was not raised in a Christian home. He did not have the gift of being passed on from his parents or his grandparents what we've talked about this morning. It really just helps us to see that this does not happen by accident, but really it takes so much intentionality to personally possess this type of view of God that is serious, that is lofty, that is that is biblical and not just based on our feelings. And so that in practicing that personally, praising the Lord personally, we would look to another generation and be able to help them, instruct them, teach them, and pass on these truths to another generation. That's my prayer for my life. That's my prayer for all of us this morning, that this would be our, our heartbeat, 
and that this would be something that we, we think about in our interactions, especially with the young people in your church. Think of the opportunity that you have in this morning service to step out of these doors and fellowship with not just folks that are in your generation, but folks that are younger than you, the teenagers, the elementary students, and the young people, to help them and to encourage them in their walk with the Lord and to pass on the praise and the excellencies of the Lord. Not for our glory, but for God's glory alone. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me this morning? We'll conclude with, with a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for the opportunity to look at Psalm 145 this morning and how it speaks to our hearts. It's so powerful to hear from the psalmist David of his desire to not just praise you for who you are and extol you and bless you personally, but then to have the perspective of in doing that faithfully in a patterned way, then pass those things on to another generation. What an opportunity we have as your people to do that even here in this church and in the influence that you've given to each one of us in family relationships, grandparents to grandchildren, great-grandparents to great-grandchildren and grandchildren, to pour into another generation, not so that some name would be established, not so that some family would have recognition, not so that some church even would be would be recognized, but that your name would be lifted up and that another generation would know your mighty acts. Lord, we, we praise you this morning for your goodness in our lives. We could sit here for hours and hours and hours and count our many blessings as we name them one by one. Think of all the ways that you have been good to us. And this morning, we do want to pause and just thank you for our salvation, for the grace that you have extended to each one of us in our lives. For those of us who know you as our personal Savior, to be saved, to have a right relationship with you through the Lord Jesus Christ. That is a gift that we, we could never purchase, that we could never earn, that we will never repay. And it's a gift that we praise you for this morning. Lord, you are high and lifted up. You are great. Your greatness is unsearchable. And we want to praise you greatly this morning. And I pray that that would be our heart as we go into the worship service even this morning, that we would come to you with these things in mind and that we would praise you, worship you in spirit and in truth, that you would encourage our hearts, speak to us through the wonderful word of God and through the music as it is presented as well. And we'll just give you all the glory for how you work in our hearts today. And we thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.